All right, so this was kind of the culminating uh, review sheet on rates of change, a little bit of average rate of change, a whole lot of um, instantaneous rate of change or tangent slopes. Uh, number one, um, just a kind of standard linear function. It's the average rate of change over the interval, negative two to eight. So we're really just finding two points, negative two something, eight something. Plug them into the function to figure out what those values would be and then find the slope. Um, turned out to be negative two, which is the uh, the slope of the line, because you see lines are constant functions. They always have the same rate, and so their average rate of change will always be the same as the uh, overall rate of change of that line. In fact, uh, when you on part B find the instantaneous rate of change, which is a little bit more work because we have to use the difference quotient, look at that, it's also negative two. Um, the instantaneous rate of change at any point on a line is still going to be equal to the slope because the slope of a linear function will never change. So it's kind of a boring question, but uh, just kind of get you going with the difference between average rate of change and instantaneous. Usually it's different, so please be careful that you really pay attention what kind of rate of change are they looking for. If, if they're asking for average, don't, um, you know, jump into the... Uh, the difference quotient because it's not going to help you. It's just slope. Just y minus y over x minus x for average rate of change. Number two got a little more exciting because it was a parabola, right? An x squared. Um, but the first part was still just asking for the average rate of change. So um, y minus y over x minus x is your formula. The plug negative 2 into the function, plug 8 into the function. These are the y values that you would have gotten if you did that. You should be showing that work where, you know, off to the side or even within the function. But if I plug negative 2 in, I get negative 15. If I plug 8 in, I should get 105. It looks like it turns out to be 12. Now, what is the instantaneous rate of change at 3? Um, a lot of people would say, well, 3 is halfway between these. So if it's halfway between that average, shouldn't it be just the same as the average rate of change. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. For for quadratics, sometimes it will be because of quadratic growth, but in general, that's not going to be the case. So the fact that it worked out to be true in this case is kind of a little bit of a uh, uh, just a coincidence. But um, here you go. Um, this entire piece right here is plugging 3 plus h into our original function and you can see that it very slowly uh, expands as we distribute and then everything that does not have an h should go away and sure enough the uh, the 27 we would get from the 9 and the 18 go away with this negative 27 we get and all you have left are things with H's, so it should work that way every single time. Um, once you have your slope, which we found the slope was 12, right? You should be able to plug that slope in the point. Remember, you found a point uh, here. When you when you did G of 3, it gave you 20. That's the point, 320. Don't go back and recalculate that. You already have it, 320. There's your point. There's your slope. Plug them into Y equals MX plus B. And you're done. Um, what's the normal? So the normal is, remember, perpendicular to the tangent. And that's going to take the opposite reciprocal slope. The opposite uh, of a positive 12 is a negative 12. And the reciprocal of 12 is 1 12th, so negative 1 12th. That's the normal. Normal is uh, perpendicular to tangent. Um, number three, it's a little bit different, uh, square root function. And so if you're getting stuck on this one, um, I wouldn't wouldn't necessarily blame you. However, I got zero questions on this assignment, so maybe some people just skipped it. But if you um, if you use the conjugates, you can work your way through. Um, you know, plugging in 7 plus h to begin with isn't too bad. You can, you can reduce and get h plus 4, and the square root of 4, of course, is just 2. So that's this uh, this part of the problem right here. But then from that, how do you how do you get this h on the bottom to cancel with 
you don't want H on the top, you don't have an H on the top to cancel, so you're stuck. And that's where conjugates come in play. And different kinds of conjugates, um, you just have to take the conjugate of the entire numerator. Uh, but if you notice these two things right here are conjugates, and then when you distribute, things work out really nicely, um, and you end up being finally able to cancel that H. This is what you were looking for the whole time, is those H's to cancel, and you get one fourth. So I imagine if somebody can't follow that algebra, that you'll let me know. But for the time being, um, that is how you do that. Uh, part B. It's just to find the tangent line at that point. Well, now that we have the point, and remember, um, we know that x is 7, um, but we found up here, when we did h of 7, we found that the y value there was 2. So we have our point, 7, 2, and now we have our slope that we found right here, 1 fourth. And once you have a point and a slope, it's algebra 1. Algebra 1, plug them in, find the equation of your line. Uh, number 4 was one of those rational functions. You've now done a handful of these, so they should be getting a little bit more normal for you. Um, once again, I you can combine these with a common denominator and then kind of simplify from that point, but I would take that common denominator, multiply through, and get rid of all the composite fractions. See these composite fractions, which make this such an ugly problem? Look, gone. They're gone. You do have to be careful that you're distributing correctly, um, but uh, it's a quick way of doing it. And then you get to a point where you can finally get those H's right there to go away. That's what you want. And then you get your um, your tangent slope. This time they want the equation of the normal. So we have to take the opposite reciprocal of negative 2 25ths, which would be positive 25 halves, right? Opposite reciprocals. Number five, just a quadratic. Uh, this time she's going down. So we... Uh, doesn't really make any difference. We still do the, the math all the same way. Um, we uh, distribute it out, cancel it down. Everything without a an H should go away um, toward the end. And sure enough, here's you know positive 34 here, but here's negative 34 here. Those things cancel out. All you have left are H terms, and there's your slope of negative eight. Um, what were we supposed to do with it? We want the tangent, so we take, uh, oh, this one, so this one was at 5. This time they want the same slope, but they wanted it at 1. So if we do the same math, look at that, um, except I changed the 5 into a 1 here and here, and then instead of doing g of, one, of 5, I did g of 1, which turned out to be 25. Still, at some point, everything without uh, an H goes away. Like these were 26, and this was negative 26. And then all you have is a slope of 0. So um, on part A, you get a slope of negative 8. On part B, you get a slope of 0. Part C said, what's so special about a slope of 0? Well, we know that lines that that are uh, have a slope of 0 are horizontal. And we know that parabolas, even negative parabolas, can only have a zero tangent at the place where we're changing direction that's the uh, the vertex and so that's what would happen is we would be at the parabola's vertex um number uh part d wants you to do the work one more time but this time instead of plugging in a five or plugging in a one or plugging in a known value they want you to just plug in a, a generic value that you say plug in a this makes the algebra a little worse because there's a lot of things that normally would combine earlier on or cancel that don't. But in the end, um, we still get cancellation with all the things that don't have H's. So here's like a 24 and a negative 24. Here's like a, a 2A, but here's like a negative 2A. Here's an A squared over here, but look over here, a negative 2A squared. And so in the end, you only get... Um, one, two, three terms left that don't, uh, that have H's, right? So then we can factor that H out and finish the problem. This formula right here is, is uh, terribly 
powerful. This is called the derivative of the original function. What it allows you to do is determine the tangent slope at any place. You know, part A asks you, what is the tangent slope at 5? And we went through all this work and we found that it was negative 8. But if I would have just plugged 5 into that formula, 2 minus 2 times 5 would be 2 minus 10, negative 8. Bam, you would have had your tangent slope within seconds rather than minutes. Um, similarly, on uh, part uh, 2, what's the tangent slope at 1? Well, 2 minus 2 times 1 is 2 minus 2 is 0. Boom, tangent slope of 0. That's how I know that there is a, um, you know, a vertex at that point because of the horizontal slope. See how quickly you could find tangent slopes when you have the general form. This is where calculus will make your job a lot easier, which is where you'll pick up in, uh, you know, next year, um, learning shortcuts for these types of things. Uh, number six, is the function going to have a tangent line at the, the spot where the two halves of this function meet? So first of all, there has to be continuity. And so we plug in three to both the, the right and the left function, and we find, oh, yeah, they, are, they both are going to meet at the same height. So they, we do have continuity. Cool. But what about the tangent? Are the tangents going to agree? And so when we, uh, when we check into it, um, they do not. Uh, one of them has a, a fairly steep slope of 11. The other one has a less steep slope of 4. So it's not going to be smooth at that point right there. Um, you know what? I'm going to pause this and graph it for you so you can see what a picture of this would look like. All right, so here's some uh, here's some digital aid here. So we got a slope of 11 coming in from the left function. We have a slope of four. Uh, we have a slope of four from the right function. So from the left, it's much steeper. And here's what we see at three, right? That's the break point. So we have this parabola that comes down and is getting steeper and steeper and has a really steep tangent slope right at that point. Look at that. Look at that. That slope right there is um, is the slope of 11, right? On the other hand, this other uh, this other graph takes over. It's, it always has a slope of 4, right? It's a, it's a line, 4x plus 12, so it's always going to have a slope of 4, so it's never going to change. But what it does is it creates this sharp point where we have two different tangent slopes right here and that um, that creates a corner uh, at this point which means that you, you can't have a, a, a tangent line uh, it's it, everywhere else on this it's smooth but at that one point you get that that tangent uh, that can't exist because of the sharp point okay now on uh, on seven you, you can't have a tangent right based on the first check when you check to see if the rational function on the left and the cubic function on the right are continuous at two. That's where they, they break. They're not even continuous. You have a height of three and a height of five. So here's that graph. You've got, you know, you've got your um, rational function. And notice how it's x minus one on the bottom. So the, the vertical asymptote has been, uh, has been translated one unit over to the um, right. So this is where normally it's on the y-axis right but now it's been shifted over here and so that part of the function looks just like it normally would but remember it stops at two because this, this cubic function takes over at two and you can see there's a jump discontinuity when that occurs and so um, we cannot have uh, an, a tangent even if and it doesn't look like these tangents would agree anyway um, because you've got uh, you know, a pretty steep, steep negative slope here, a pretty steep positive slope here. So those tangents wouldn't have agreed anyway. But you can't have uh, tangents that exist when the continuity is not present. Okay. Now the last one, we do have continuity again. Uh, we've got a parabola on the right and another rational function on the left. Actually, take that back. The parabola is coming in on, from the left, for the rational function on the right. So you, you plug in one, you get zero. Um, for the continuity check, look at that. Okay, so when I when I graph this, what I'm going to find is, look at that. It's a continuous function, even though they're totally different functions. They have the 
the parabola giving way to the rational function right there. That's good. And it, and it doesn't look too bad. I mean, it looks smoother than the other ones did because the slopes are closer, but it's not close enough. It's still enough of a corner there. And you can see that coming in from the left, my slope was two, my tangent slope was two. Uh, on the right, it was, it was one half. And so we have, a, a, you know, a comparatively steep slope of two here, where the parabola gives way to the to the uh, rational function. By the way, the rational function, if you remember, um, end behavior is is power over power. Well, one over one, right? X over X is just one over one. It's going to have a horizontal asymptote at one. Here's one right here. So we know that this thing's going to be flattening out into a into a horizontal uh, asymptote uh, overall for this graph. But what we're interested in is what's happening right here at the, the slope at one, and it looks like this guy has a slope right around here, tangent slope right about that. And it's uh, it's a tech. It's I think it's one half is what we found on the previous um, uh, page. I guess up here we could go up and check. Yep, yeah, was one half. So that, relatively speaking, that's flatter than two. It's closer than eleven and four on the on two problems ago, but still, the tangent slopes can a tangent line can exist. The tangent slopes don't agree coming in, and so that was those three those problems. Those problems require a little bit more work. Uh, problem nine was just an application problem. Drop a, an object from 100 meters up, and it's going down at 4.9 meters per second. So you you start at your height, right? 100 minus 4.9 t squared. That's your uh, that's your equation. Um, three seconds after it's dropped is where we're checking. So basically, what that means, I'm going to take that three and I'm going to plug that in for the t, right? I'm going to plug that in for the t. And then you just do it like you would do the normal problems. It's these problems with bigger numbers and the decimals tend to be a little less fun to work out. So these are the ones that we tried to keep simple. And we know on in class tests with no calculators, but um, but as you can see, uh, uh, in the end, they really work out the same. The the, the terms with no H's have to go away. So like these are going to cancel out. You just have H terms left. You can cancel those H's and you get negative 29.4. That negative means the velocity is, is negative, meaning it's falling down uh, 29.4 meters per second. Um, but the speed would be 24.9 meters per second. Um, and then finally, uh, number 10, um, was one of those rate of change problems. And you could have done this three times for the three different radii, two, five, and 10. But my hint was, hey, just do it one time. Just use an R for radius. It's going to make the algebra a little funkier the first time through. But then you can very quickly get the three answers. So hopefully you did it that way. Notice how um, as soon as I could, I, I, I took this pi right here. Right, whoa, I took this pi right here and um, canceled it out or factored it out so that I didn't have to deal with the pi inside. And then I was just dealing with the, um, the simple terms. The R, the R squareds cancel, we can factor the H out just like we have seen time and time again. And uh, we get two pi R. So two pi R is your formula to generate slopes anywhere for um, that function. And so if I wanted to know it at 2, I would plug a 2 in. Um, 2 times pi times 2 is 4 pi. And that was the answer there, right? 4 pi inches, uh, square inches per inch of radius. The area is changing at that point. Plug a 5 in. Plug a 5 in. 2 times pi times 5 is 10 pi. And sure enough, that's what we got there. See how much faster that is if you have to do it multiple times, right? Um, now, the pi r squared is really just a parabola. You know, if it was two, if it was a two x squared, you guys would be like, "Oh, that's pretty easy. That's x squared." You know, a little steeper with a two out front. Well, this is r squared, so it's just a parabola, but with a pi out front. So it's an irrational 
not a constant, but it's still just going to be a parabola. And so here is my little picture of this with the parabola. And you can see that as we go further and further out, as the radius gets bigger, those tangent slopes are increasing because the area is growing faster and faster. So I just kind of estimated, you know, 2, 5, and 10, and you can see how the areas are getting uh, changing more steeply. But anyway, there's your uh, quick walkthrough. Nobody asked for any of these specifically, so I, I definitely didn't spend too much time with any of them. But uh, hopefully if there were things you weren't sure about, maybe I helped you understand them a little better there. Maybe not. Uh, remember that you will have a short uh, written quiz today. It will be put out in about an hour uh, at 10 o'clock. And I guess less than an hour by the time that it renders and gets loaded. But uh, it will be due at 3. So a five-hour window to get that done. Good luck on that. And uh, we'll start reviewing for the summative quiz.